Anonymous. Okay. Where should I? Yeah, no, no, okay. okay. I have to hold the mic, but I have the lady. Yes. Are you ready back there? Unmuted. Good afternoon and welcome to the first presentation of the spring 2022 season of the Medical History Interest Group Lecture Series. I'm Mary Roby, Assistant Director at Lapis Library. The Medical History Interest Group presentations are sponsored as part of the Ruth and John Moskop Lecture Series and the Lapis Library History Collections. If you haven't already done so, please sign the attendance sheet before you leave. Refreshments are available on the other side of the wall, and please help yourself. The upcoming presentations in the spring 2022 series are, on Monday, April 4th, My Memories of the Holocaust with Walter J. Puris, MD, Professor and Founding Chair of the Department of Surgery at ECU. This lecture is co-sponsored with the Pitt County Historical Society. And on Thursday, April 21st, Penicillin, Propaganda, and the Death of the Prostation in World War II by John A. Popolis III, M.D., Dermatopathologist, Eastern Dermatology and Pathology. We have several history exhibits on display today. Here on the fourth floor, we have a pop-up exhibit related to today's lecture. The display features materials from Lapis Library's history collections. We also have scientists and their microscopes, which shows various microscopes in our collection with images of well-known scientists who use the same versions in their research. On the second floor of the library to commemorate 300 years since the pirate Blackbeard's adventures around North Carolina, we have the plague of piracy. The exhibit includes photos and artifact cast replicas on loan from the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology and the Queen Anne's Revenge Lab. It is complemented with artifacts from the Country Doctor Museum. Today's presentation is The Scientific Revolution in Management Efficiency and Its Effects on American Medical Practice from the Early 20th Century On. Our presenter is William C. Wood, MD, Colonel. USAFR retired, cardiovascular sciences retired. Dr. Wood recently completed over 48 years of medical practice, serving in the military, private practice, academic, and veterans affairs environments. He is a retired colonel in the USAF Reserve and maintains an active interest in medical history, military history, and military medical history. Dr. Wood is a graduate of the USAF Air War College. He completed his internal medicine residency at the University of Tennessee in 1979 and his cardiology fellowship at the University of Tennessee in 1981. He has a particular interest in medical organizational history. His recent interest is in the progressive movement of scientific efficiency and its influence on medical practice in the United States in the time period 1900 through 1920. Here is William C. Wood with the scientific revolution in management efficiency and its effects on American medical practice from the early 20th century on. this topic. Uh, this has been my topic of uh, interest uh, during the pandemic, uh, and it's the longest I've ever prepared for a talk. It's, it's over two years. Uh, of all the periods of history, uh, the one I probably was least interested in three years ago was the progressive period uh, between about 1895 and 1916. It didn't have the fascination that I had for uh, the wartime years of 1939 to 1945, and really, uh, I had ignored it for a very, very long period of time. I have no disclosures. As I started to study this, in combination with my interest in the development of medical organizations, 
Uh, I had already looked at two uh, of the great clinics, the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic. When they got their start, the background of the individuals who planned their organization. And at the Mayo Clinic, there was a, a, a fascinating individual named Hen Henry Stanley Plummer. And Dr. Plummer was an organizational genius and I became very interested in his life, what he had done, what he had contributed. And I wondered where his ideas had come from. It turns out that in the progressive period, there was a prominent business theorist named uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. And there was an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine by Hertzban and Groupman some years ago about medical Taylorism. I, I was impressed. I was totally unaware of what Taylorism was, and I didn't have a good understanding of scientific management. So I had four questions. The first, what are Taylorism and what is scientific management? Second, where did Dr. Plummer get his ideas? What were the intellectual sources of the uh, concepts and procedures that he used to basically design what is today the modern Mayo Clinic. To what extent did the Taylor manufacturing method and scientific management influence American medicine in the progressive era? And last, what elements of American medicine today are strongly influenced by Taylorism and scientific management. I, I quote this remark by a hospitalist in uh, the journal Today's Hospitalist in 2014, quote, we see the hospital as a factory and our hospitalist group as an assembly line that is in the business of manufacturing perfect discharges, end quote. And I, when I read that, I was, I was shocked. I said, how did we get here? Where did we come? The, my, my training in medicine was, was really back in the days where all we talked about were sick people and how to get them well. This is sort of a rogues gallery of the, uh, a number of very prominent people in the progressive period. So William Os Osler spent the 1890s at Johns Hopkins uh, where internal medicine was developed. Uh, the next 10 years saw the Flexner Report. Dr. Plummer and the Mayos from 1901 to 1914 really laid down the ground rules for the Mayo Clinic, and it has been a successful, thriving organization to this day. Physicians, Codman and Cabot were early adopters of scientific management. Frederick Winslow Taylor is probably the most prominent business theorist of the 19th century and his uh, influence list today. Henry Ford in the assembly line. Uh, the architect Albert Kahn, uh, and I will discuss how his architecture is similar to that of Dr. Plummer's, but in a different area. The Gilbris uh, were early scientific management. You probably don't remember Lillian Gilbert, but if you've ever seen the movie Cheaper by the Dozen, that's the, that's the 12 children in that family. The other thing is when you open your refrigerator and you look at the doors inside the refrigerator door, uh, the shelves where you put items. That was part of her, her development. That's where that comes from. And last, we have uh, Louis Brandeis, the famous Supreme Court Justice, and he's a part of the activity of the progressive movement as well. Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote a, a, a wonderful book called The Bully Pulpit, and she made this statement. There are but a handful of times in the history of our country when there occurs a transformation so remarkable that a molt seems to take place and an altered country begins to emerge. The turn of the 20th century was such a time and Theodore Roosevelt is counted among our greatest presidents 
one of the few to attain that eminence without having surmounted some pronounced national crisis, revolution, war, widespread national depression. And there are many parallels politically between our present time and the progressive period. Uh, indeed, in the progressive period, Roosevelt, a Republican, had decided that he didn't want to quit being president and he wanted to take the presidency away from Taft by election. And actually, they, they ran against each other. He formed the Bull Moose Party and Woodrow Wilson won the election. Uh, it's a wonderful book. It's full of detail about the progressive period. There are a number of what are called industrial revolutions in which dramatic changes occurs in society and manufacturing. The British Industrial Revolution with steam engines, the second industrial revolution, when we see the uh, inventions of Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, electricity, telephone, telegraph, railroads, mass production, bicycles, automobiles, all occurred during this period of time. And this is the progressive period. The information revolution is the third, and we're entering the fourth scientific revolution, which is really a fusion of data and biologics uh, that's equally exciting. Now, during the progressive period, uh, a concept that really caught on was efficiency. And Rucker stated, quote, the watchword of the age is efficiency, the doing away with haphazard methods and the substitution thereof of the methods of precision, end quote. And this concept of being efficient, of studying the science behind efficiency permeated all, all sectors of American society, social work, politics, um, and medicine, of course. Now, scientific management is defined by one of the real outstanding people in this uh, 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 subject, uh, Frank Galbraith, as, quote, scientific management might be perhaps better defined as measured functional management it rests on the principle of applying accurate measurements to present practice deriving from the results of measurements and the observations made while taking, while taking it the standard practice, end quote. Now, scientific management really came along in what was called the Eastern Rate Case in 1910. At that time, the railroads and the railroads were an enormous part of American society. The way they had uh, learned how to move vast quantities of materials, organize people, run schedules, it really changed the world. They were very powerful and they decided they wanted to increase the rates to move freight. And the, the, the court case became very prominent, but Louis Brandeis, the progressive lawyer argued that if the railroads used scientific management, they'd save a million dollars a day and they wouldn't need to raise the rates. And the rates were not raised and the term scientific management entered our vocabulary. This is the editorial by Pamela Hartsevan and Jerome Groupman on medical Taylorism. And they discuss four elements of medical Taylorism. Frederick Taylor uh, was really born into great wealth and lived on the Philadelphia main line uh, and attended uh, very prestigious schools, but didn't go to college. Uh, he felt his health was not uh, good enough and his eyesight was, wasn't good enough to go to college. So he actually chose a different path that I'll discuss. Taylor believed that the components of every job could and should be scientifically studied, measured, timed, and standardized to maximize efficiency and profit. He believed, and his disciples, as they called them, believed that there was one best way to do every task. And he emphasized that the system was the primary concern, not the individual. And we'll see a lot of this in, in the organization of the great medical clinics. 
medical Taylorism had had three characteristics that not not everyone was happy with. One was standardized systems. The other was the use of the stopwatch. And this will create, as we will see, a number of controversies. American labor doesn't like stopwatches. And I suspect if you talk with physicians who have been subjected to these types of studies, they didn't like it either. The aim of uh, medical Taylorism was to make every interaction standardized. And we'll see how that happened. And the electronic medical record became, quote, a key instrument for measuring the duration and standardizing the content of patient-doctor interactions. So we'll, we'll see how that uh, happened. What they, the original intent at least what was verbalized for scientific management was that by being more efficient, by being standardized, you'd produce more in less time, make more money, and have more free time. Well, it, it really didn't work out like that, but at least that was the initial idea. And this is uh, uh, Frederick W. Taylor, and after, uh, Taylor died in the middle portion of the second decade of the 20th century. Uh, his wife commissioned a two volume biography of, uh, of actually Dr. Taylor. And on his tombstone, tombstone it reads, Father of Scientific Management. Now, uh, Mr. Taylor was not one to avoid. Uh, uh, emphasizing his outstanding traits. In this rather busy slide, on the left side, you see the events that led to the formation of the Mayo Clinic. The, the Mayo Clinic actually came to be called the Mayo Clinic probably early in the 20th century. It was formed by the older Dr. Mayo and his two sons, Will and Charlie. Uh, and then they added other physicians, including Dr. Plummer, who we'll discuss in detail later, who joined them in 2001. The Mayo Clinic 1914 building was the first building engineered and designed to fulfill the practices and procedures of a private medical practice. And I emphasize the Mayo Clinic was a private medical practice. It was not an academic or publicly supported organization. It, its funds came only from within the practice of the Mayos, their partners, and their associates. And that 1914 building is a really landmark of engineering and process. The 1928 building, which is still there, beautiful building, uh, beautiful architecture and has Carillon uh, was built in 1928 and expanded the technological developments that were implemented in 1914. On the right side is, is uh, Frederick Taylor's career. And Taylor, as I said, didn't go to college. He went to work in a machine shop and he worked on a lathe. And with the lathe, he would cut metals. And it, it turns out that using a lathe and cutting metals and developing cutting steel was a dynamic part of American industrial development. That's what let uh, mechanics, mechanical engineers, designers build railroads, automobiles, ships, aircraft carriers, jet planes, rockets is the ability to shape metal. And Taylor studied the interactions among the people in the shop and came up with a system of how to do it. He, he emphasized a number of items, time study, divided foremanship. Previously, there was a shop foreman who sort of was a subcontractor so like when you build a house now, they got everybody together. Taylor changed this so that he had six or eight different foremen, 
each with different jobs. He standardized the tools. He took planning away from workmen. He did away with the uh, artisan who was expert in their field and replaced it with the planning department that came up with detailed instruction sheets for the workmen. And in this way, the company was able to hire unskilled work people and put them into the production process. There was a task idea, a differential rate, and time doesn't permit uh, to discuss so much of the work Taylor did on how to pay people. But even in medicine, if you, if you read the non-medical journals about medical economics, it's still a real question of how you pay professionals. And it was a question of how you paid workmen for Taylor. And he basically said, we will find people who are better at this, who can work faster, and we will pay them more money. He wouldn't say, we'll train them to be better. It was more selection of what he called high dollar men. A routing system and cost accounting, and cost accounting is, is not a very interesting subject uh, for medical people, but it's really key to industrial development because what costing a cost accounting did was it broke down all the processes and it allowed managers to see what elements of an industrial process cost money. There were some fixed elements and some variable elements. And the whole intent of industrial management was to produce an adequate product with standardized parts in large quantities at a low labor rate. And it was important to drive the cost down, just drive it down to the bone uh, even then, certainly, certainly it is now. Now, you know how in uh, the Academy Awards that's coming up this weekend, the actors always think they're, college, they're high school drama teacher. Well, it turns out that uh, uh, Taylor's math teacher is, was really his hero because his math teacher, Bull Wentworth, figured out a way to time the students and figure out how long it should take everybody to answer every math problem. And he, Taylor adopted this method of timing and estimating uh, what people should be able to do. And he developed the idea that, quote, there is no class of work which cannot be profitably submitted to time study by dividing it into its time elements, except such operations as take place in the head of the worker, end quote. And for any physician who's had 15 minutes for a new patient, for any uh, nurse practitioner who's had five minutes for a follow-up, this is where that came from. This is where this type of thinking got started. And the dreaded stopwatch, when the stopwatch appeared in industrial studies, it, it created enormous disruption among later, later. We talked about the Eastern Rate case, but in 1911 and 1912, Congress investigated the Taylor method because workmen went on strike because they didn't want to be timed. And this had enormous repercussions, which lasted at least 30 years. Now, Let's talk about Dr. Plummer. This is my favorite picture of Dr. Plummer, uh, Dr. Plummer and, and Dr. Charlie Mayo. And this is in the uh, uh, main stone being set for the 1928 building. And it's interesting, even the Mayos, every time they'd build a new building, they'd get worried about how much this was going to cost. But they pressed on through and built both buildings despite that. It was a private practice. Now, Plummer was, was truly a polymath, and there's just a handful of people who are geniuses in multiple areas. Plummer was, in, I think, in information systems. I, I think he was really the landmark person 
to have developed the medical record system, the Mayo in 1907, that we will talk about. But also he was a polymath in architecture and engineering. And he was also a horticulturist uh, uh, in addition. Now, when the Mayos uh, got started, they were working out of a Masonic lodge using ledgers uh, to write their individual cases. Uh, they had to go sort of in back of the buildings behind the other stores to see all their patients. But they said, and this is from uh, Willius, who wrote the only, only biography of Stanley Plummer. It's a little thin book. Quote, while never having had formal training in architecture, Henry Plummer, through his own efforts, became a master builder. He read extensively on many phases of the subject, and his facile mind retained many of the details of this science and art. He thoroughly understood the physical laws of stress and strain, and he knew much of the history of architecture, end quote. But there's a wonderful movie uh, called Forever Looking Forward that's part of the Mayo Historical Film Series, and they have an actor who's Henry Plummer, and they have Henry Plummer talking to Dr. Will Mayo, and Dr. Mayo says, we want you to organize this project, and Plummer says, well, tell me how you want to practice medicine. And that is really crucial because what Plummer did was design not only a building, but an information system and a way of organizing the whole structure of a medical organization to follow the principles that the Mayos laid down. And, and it's just a, a it could be another talk. It has been a previous talk, but it's important to know that the building was a result of the concept of operation that was agreed upon by the Mayos and Dr. Plummer and their colleagues. Now, quote, after considerable research of record systems at other medical centers, Dr. Plummer was not impressed and turned to business and industry for his inspiration. End quote. And this has been a personal fascination of mine because Dr. Plummer disappeared. He, some people say he disappeared for a few weeks. Nobody's really sure how long he disappeared. It's probably a month or so. No one really knows where he went. And he came back with the idea of the Mayo Clinic the, in a series of notebooks. And Frederick Willius described the notebooks, quote, an armful of loose leaf notebooks in which he had charted the integrated type of practice which the Mayo Clinic and other distinguished medical institutions still follow. The plan was entirely original with Dr. Plum. And I've just been obsessed with these notebooks. And so I went to Rochester I went to Dr. Plummer's house. I've written to everybody I know. The caretaker of the home has not seen any notebooks. No one knows where the notebooks went, but a personal communication with the med uh, 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 medical history unit of Mayo says that at some point after Dr. Plummer's death, someone came to the home, went to a closet, and removed items. So the, the notebooks have never been found, but they are the foundation documents of the modern Mayo Clinic, the mystery of the missing notebooks. Now, Dr. Plummer developed the unified medical record. And what that is, is that he put, people would come to the Mayo Clinic and they get a thousand new patients a day now. They use an electronic medical record system. They actually use EPIC. But at the time that he and Maybell Root, who needs much more credit for this operation than, than she generally gets, the two of them organized a dossier system where a patient came and received a number. And the first Mayo Clinic patient was 001 000 a something like that. And 
all the patient's records went in an envelope. And when they came back, they went in the same envelope. And when I visited the Mayo Clinic in 1992 uh, to watch some procedures, here came the envelope. It was a plastic clear envelope with folded paper. But it was the first time that the chart was put in one place so that consultants could see all the information. Dr. Plummer designed conveyors, pneumatic tubes, color-coded light system, underground walkways, policies, templates, and forms. There were hundreds of standardized forms, and these were used in other hospitals. It was quite uh, a part of scientific management at that time in industry to use standardized forms and to do a physical exam. You had a checklist and this, the Mayo Clinic used this, they had color coded forms. And what the Mayo Clinic did after Dr. Plummer died was institutionalize this way of doing things in a section on procedures and records. So they do really, it's interesting to see why world-class organizations maintain their status for 120 years is they really are good at organization and policies. So what Plummer did, they still do. These are, I, can, I could only find four pages of original handwriting of Dr. Plummer. These are two of them. They're in the Mayo archives. He left very few papers this is the 1914 building, and it's not really the building. It's the way the building worked uh, that's, that's so fascinating. The system of communication, the constantly moving mechanical conveyor that moved the histories through the floors, end quote. It was really a, a brilliant system. Now, there is an analogy of brilliance in doing this, this same thing. And that's in the engineering of the big automobile plants. And there was an architect called Albert Kahn. And Albert Kahn is the famous designer of the Ford Motor Company plants uh, that you see here. And these were the legendary plants. On the left is Highland Park, on the right, the River Rouge plant. And to this day, these plants still operate. One of them uh, produces the F-150 pickup today. But he designed, the architect for Ford designed how equipment moves on an assembly line uh, in order to facilitate efficiency and lower cost. And I emphasize that the Mayo Clinic is not an assembly line. There's a critical difference there. At the Mayo Clinic, the patient stayed in one place and the doctors came to the patient. The patient did not move through a moving conveyor belt. It's totally different. So we look at a few examples of doctors who employed scientific management as part uh, of their processes in this period. Now you can imagine when Robert Dickinson went to other surgeons and told them that they were gonna standardize everything. Uh, most people don't like being told what to do, but he, he wanted to adjust responsibilities, print out instruction cards, constantly inspect, make a list of what you did right and wrong, promote by rating and uh, undertake motion studies, speed, fatigue, and efficiency. And this, although the, uh, the, ar the article is very interesting, you can imagine the enthusiasm with which the surgeons of that pe period adopted these uh, things. There are two mentions in, that I've been able to find in two years that connect the Mayo clinic or its physicians directly with scientific medicine. And one is in a paper by Dickinson where he talks about, quote, that infected genius plumber, end quote, in his standardized forms. Now, this is an example of 
of the organization of the hospital system, hospital staff that Dickinson want to do. And I'm sure if you look at any hospital today, you'll see an organization chart that will have many similarities. He wanted to lay out a plan. Uh, and this was Gilbreth, who was another disciple of uh, Taylor. Gilbreth wanted to have how to make a report, record the process, examine the data, create a planning department, and then adapt the plan and and then take pictures of everything. And not only that, but Gilbreth and uh, his wife Lillian, they they invented time motion studies. That's where time motion studies came from. That's where athlete, you, athletes are filmed to see how they can improve their performance. And they invented psychographic analysis where the work was on the background of a grid and lights were put on hands and they could time the actions of people's hands. And they did this and created a, a dictionary of time movements. I don't have time to show it, but if you go to the New England Journal article and go to this site, you'll see one of Gilbert's uh, movies regarding surgery. Instead of the stopwatch, Gilbert used these uh, psychographic analyses. And it, it's interesting that he actually went into the operating room and had surgeons and nurses uh, participate in these studies. Again, it was not widely adopted. Poole and Bancroft in their paper on systemization of a surgical service looked at the movements of the circulating nurses as they went about the operating room and optimize the movement in, in business management. Uh, today, you have things like optimization pro problems where you have 10 trucks and 40 warehouses and you wanna know how to get everything there in the shortest possible time. Well, this is optimization of the operating room. Now, Poole and Bancroft wanted, and I'll quote, all routine operations should be standardized the arrangement of the room should be uniform. A given number of instruments on the tray, same suture materials and instruments, uh, in quote, were to be used. Really almost a, a manufacturing concept. Now, Cabot was a very interesting physician. There's a lot more to say about Cabot, but he got the idea of how important uh, multidisciplinary medicine was. And this, this at the Mass General Hospital, it wasn't too radical a step, but group practice of medicine, as in the Mayo and Cleveland clinics, was uh, a really different story for private American practice at that time. There was a guy named Codman, and Codman defined efficiency as therapeutic effectiveness. And one thing you see is that efficiency is defined a lot of different ways. And it was defined so many ways that it became almost anything you wanted it to mean. Now, this was my favorite finding in two years of study is I went through uh, Frederick Taylor's testimony before Congress uh, when his method of management was investigated. And it was sort of a contentious uh, set of uh, dispositions, but he made the statement, this is part of his congressional te uh, testimony, quote, last evening, I met one of the surgeons from Mayo Brothers, and earlier in the fall, I met Mr. Mayo himself. He came east from his work, as he told me, largely to see me and talk about the principles of scientific management. He made the statement that his establishment, and it was corroborated by the doctor I met yesterday, is run so far as possible along the principles of scientific management, end quote. Now, uh, Taylor was not one to, uh, hide his uh, genius from anybody else. And I think you have to 
have to take that with a grain of salt, but it's the only time I could connect the Mayos and Taylor. And in terms of efficiency at the Mayo Clinic, uh, I found this, and this is from uh, one of the doctors who, who wrote uh, memoirs of the early time, and I, I love this, quote, operations began early and on time. There were no unnecessary delays because some detail however minor had not been done beforehand. No member of the team was ever late. This was not because of dread of consequences. It was simply unthinkable not to be on time, end quote. You can imagine the house staff and their assisting, Will, Dr. Will Mayo or Dr. Charlie, you just, no one was ever late. So Davis uh, became very interested in outpatient management. And the outpatient clinic really didn't have the cachet that the uh, operating room did, but he came up with a number of techniques to organize and structure and approve the outpatient clinic. And he defined efficiency, at poor efficiency was when patients didn't come back. And he emphasized how important it was to have a follow-up system. And he also talked about you needed to relate work to expense to the outcome. And these were, were very interesting ideas at that time. So, so what happened to everybody? What happened to the efficiency movement of 1914, 1915, 1916? What happened to Taylor's system? And that's very interesting. Uh, World War I occurred and a, a, a number of the prominent people went to war. And World War I was uh, really involved a lot of the prominent people in the United States. Codman, Dickinson, and Gilbert were all involved. Uh, Gilbert had a heart attack uh, during this period of time, and, and his output was productive. Quote, the hospital efficiency movement slowly died and was not resurrected until the work of Weed in 1964. So there's a gap. There's a gap in medicine, although the efficiency management of American industry uh, move, moved along uh, in the factories and the war production of the First and Second World War. Now, Taylor uh, wrote the best-selling business book, The Principles of Scientific uh, Management. He became very famous, became very wealthy, uh, and became a management consultant. He quit work uh, really in midlife, played tennis, played golf, lived at his mansion in Boxley, and received visiting people, and he gave his lectures on efficiency. Now, unfortunately, a lot of efficiency management had come from government military production. But as a result of the congressional investigation, Congress uh, limited the ability of the Taylor system and the stopwatch and the timing of work to be applied. And that, that existed for three decades. But there was one place where it was fully adopted, Russia. And in Russia, their five-year planning process uh, was very, very Tayloristic. The Taylor disciples went to Russia, and when the Germans invaded Russia in 1941, uh, Russia had a terrible time resisting the assault, but their industrial base was a Taylorized war economy. It was nationally organized, nationally regulated, and revived really fairly quickly unlike the United States, which had to change to a war economy uh, and make a lot of, a lot of changes to, to structure it. Uh, Taylor uh, did not go to Harvard. He did get a, a PhD from Stevens Institute of Technology, but the Taylor concept, the Taylor system became the basis of the Harvard School of Business initial program. That's where the Harvard School of Business initial curriculum came from, was from Taylor. And he was, I'll quote this, 
Quote, Taylor visited Cambridge every winter to deliver a series of lectures for students. Inspirational discourses marred only by his habit of swearing at inappropriate times, end quote. Now, there are various opinions about Taylor. Peter Drucker, who's probably one of the most prominent uh, gurus of modern management, thought that Taylor was, quote, the most powerful as well as the most lasting contribution America has made to Western thought since the Federalist Papers, end quote. Now, that's, that's pretty high praise. But other people believe that, that Taylor well, he wasn't quite honest about the evidence. And there are a number of less than complimentary uh, papers in the literature and books about how when Taylor studied workers, he got the best workers, calculated times off them, uh, sort of guessed at what they could do. And when Taylor's system was put into operation, the usual sequence was a Taylor disciple went to work for a company and had this elaborate system, and then they'd get fired because the workers didn't want to be timed with a stopwatch. But some of the elements of the Taylor system would be adopted. Matthew Stewart said, quote, in 1893, after blazing a trail through Midvale and then another manufacturing company, he set himself up as an independent consulting engineer for management, in a sense, the world's first management consultant. And if, and if you look at McKinsey and Bain and these other companies now, Taylor was the first one. And I hope you'll enjoy this uh, cartoon. Uh, you can see the body, quote, from the violent nature of the multiple stab wounds, I'd say the victim was probably a consultant. And I think that uh, as medical groups and management consultants come in, I think you'll see uh, people sometimes feel that way. He was probably the most influential uh, business thinker uh, of that century. So after, after reading about this for two years, after looking at what Taylor did, and the way his system was organized and the problems and the some successes that it had. And looking at Dr. Plummer and the way the Mayo Clinic organized their system, what conclusions did I come up with? Well, the first is that uh, in, in conversation with uh, uh, Dr. Bennett, who's head of engineering at the Mayo Clinic, he related to me that Mayo Clinic Plumber is really a living person to them in spirit. They still look at things from an engineering standpoint. They look at things from an efficiency standpoint. But Plumber, in my opinion, was not a tailorist. He looked at processes and how to make medical records. He was really focused on information. Information is the key. Information is how you make decisions. And I think when people take care of COVID-19 patients in the ICU, you really see that. You have a lot of information, you have a lot of decision making. So Plummer was not a tailorist. The Mayo Clinic did uh, emphasize efficiency and design and architectural ele uh, elegance. So, In 1968, Dr. Weed came along, and Dr. Weed, quote, suggested the initial collection of data should be as complete as possible and utilize new computer and interviewing techniques and database techniques, end quote. So you sort of go back to this gap in the second decade of the 20th century where scientific management and standardization of forms and the unit medical record were, and you jump ahead to 1968, and, and Weed wants to organize the medical records uh, into uh, elements that you can uh, use to improve care. And he talked about, a quote, Weed said all narrative data in present medical records must be structured 
and in the future, all narrative data may be entered through a series of displays, end quote. So, we'd emphasize the importance of narrative in the medical record, then that's going to be an important point. This is the way the medical record uh, developed. And uh, I must say that of, of all the medical records I ever worked with, and I worked with, I think, five different ones, the VA medical record was the best. It was the clunkiest in terms of having to go through a variety of torture pathways to get data, but it was the least tailorist in defining how you used information. Indeed, one of the discharge summaries I received from a House staff member at the Durham VA, I decided was the best discharge summary I saw in 49 years. It was the most elegant, it was the most organized. It had narrative, it told the story, and then it told you where to go for the rest of the story. And that was the VA medical record. You don't hear that very much. So this is, this is interesting. I'm going to read this. Uh, there's a great article in The New Yorker by Siddhartha Mukherjee in uh, 2020. Quote, a cardiologist at Mass General Hospital in Boston echoed this frustration on Twitter. Why are nearly all notes in Epic basically useless to understand what's happening to patients during a hospital course? Another doctor's reply, because notes are used to bill, determine the level of service, and document it, rather their intended purpose, which was to convey our observations, assessment, and plan. Our important work has been co-opted by billing. And I apologize because having been out of practice for three years, if, if advances have been made that I'm not aware of, if everything's been made perfect, I apologize. I don't really think so. <clears throat> For this reason, the governor of New York actually gave a get out of jail card to the medical providers in his state, allowing them to decrease record keeping if it interfered with patient care. Burnout, there are a lot of reasons for burnout. We've heard, we don't hear so much about it now, uh, but the electronic medical record really in some ways shifted more of what you did to taking care of the medical record and keeping it healthy and interfering with your ability to interact with the patient. Uh, in 1995 and 1997, Congress uh, implemented, uh, well, in 1995, they implemented it and revised in 1997, uh, E&M coding. And this is important because E&M codes give the computer something to count. It can count if you checked ears. It can count if you checked heart. It can count if you ask about family history. It can total this up just like Taylor could when he was seeing that the workman walked to the carry pig iron and that sort of thing. In 2021, effective January 1st, a magnificent change was made in which you could either use these complicated codes, which is like a grocery shopping list that you, you had to accomplish to truthfully do the physical and history, along with an assessment of severity, or you could factor in time. For the first time in years, it restored autonomy to the physician you go to medical school, you learn how to take a history, you learn how to take a physical, and then you decide what history and what physical are appropriate. And, and this was a, a sea change. Or if you don't want to do it with time, you can use this simple coding scale to determine the complexity of the medical problem, exceeded only by the complexity of the guide to how you determine it. Now, I think that uh, Codman was on to something. In, in 1934, uh, in publication of a book on the shoulder, Codman, a famous orthopedic surgeon in Boston, put his whole life story on one piece of paper. And I believe, 
I believe that in the fourth generation of scientific revolution with computing and with an example being what's, what are called fifth generation fighter planes, or actually five generations of fighter planes. And the fifth generation of fighter planes have incredible computing capability and they fuse data. Why not? Why doesn't our medical record put all the data in one display? There are actually some programs that did this some years ago in critical care. But that would change the medical record, the electronic medical record from a billing device to a patient management device. And it may be that it would be quicker and more accurate to take care of patients if that was adopted. The other thing is that Hart's and Groupman, when they were talking about medical Taylorism, they needed us to understand when being efficient and standardized wasn't the right way to go. Sometimes being efficient isn't the right thing for the family of, and the patient. Also, resilience. If, if we learned nothing from the COVID-19 epidemic, it's that our system was a healthcare system designed to be efficient, to keep ICU beds filled. An empty ICU bed in uh, 2019 was money lost by count, cost of county. It was costing money and occupying space. Well, if the next day you have 30 patients in the emergency room and your ICU beds are full, you haven't designed a system to account for uncertainty and volatility, catastrophe. In a way, it's a totally different way of thinking, a business way of thinking where cost is very important and a military way of thinking where you plan for the worst. And I don't think the hospital systems, I think everybody, it's obvious to everyone that the system lacked resilience because the, it wasn't planned to have that much resilience. You want to measure, as Mukherjee has said, quote, what you really want to measure, model, and establish is the capacity to build something when a crisis arises. And this involves human as well as physical capital. We need to measure talent, versatility, and flexibility, end quote. And that's not what Taylorism does, but that's what medical leadership, that's what really looking to resiliency as an as important as efficiency uh, could do. So that was what I learned. And just to show you, there were uh, some really great things that I learned where they came from. Uh, in the early 1920s, the Cleveland Clinic used Ellerbee and Company. And Ellerbee built the Mayo Clinic buildings. Uh, when, when Plummer and the Mayos wanted something to build, they picked up the phone and called St. Paul. And the next day, the architect came out from Ellerbee and they and Dr. Plummer designed everything. Well, Ellerby got a very good reputation, so the Cleveland Clinic came along, and the Cleveland Clinic wanted to build a hospital. And uh, so the Cleveland Clinic doctor said, well, we really don't know if this is gonna make money or not. You know, this could go bad. So when you build our hospital, we want you to build it so it can be converted to apartments. So in order to do that, and based on the experience of one of the architects who had been had a hospital stay where he had to use the bathroom at the end of the hall, that's where the private toilet came from in the hospital room. And that's where, for efficiency's sake, two beds per room came along. And there, there's one other thing that I, I particularly am uh, impressed by when you look at the good things that came from scientific management. And I think uh, in the, about 1910 in Los Angeles, they were, started making movies and had a Wild West show on the beach on Santa Monica. And they decided to move the Wild West show to some vacant land in West Los Angeles. And then they put all the rest of the movie stuff in one place. And it turned out that was D.W. Griffin, you know, Birth of a Nation, uh, D.W. Griffin. 
by combining all the processes in one place, they created the modern movie studio. So we've gotten the private toilet, the two patient room, and the movie studio uh, from scientific management. And hopefully the electronic medical record will, will also benefit. Well, I'm going to, uh, that's more than enough. So are there any questions? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Wood. And um, questions in to the WebEx chat. We'll get to those and I'll start with one here in person. Yes, ma'am. I've read Cheaper by the Dozen and it is talking about a family of 12, I think it's 12 children, one of whom died young. And there is a lot of standardization, but it also gives you a sense of what Lillian Gilbreth, since her husband dies early, early on, actually is is doing. So you get a sense. Um, I mean, it's it's. I'm not certain whether it's it's meant exactly as a biography of their family or an autobiography of their family, or whether it's more of a novelized, whatever. Uh, autobiography, but it, you do get a good sense of what they're trying to do. And I agree it works a lot more when you're making widgets than when you're examining uh, patients who, oh, what is this doing here <laughs> that can't be uh, planned? On the other hand, I was looking at the description, the plans of the hospital in, in talking about nurses going thither, hither, thither, and yon. Obviously, that's not a good way to do it. Uh, the nurse ought to be maybe here at this point and someplace else at another point in the operation as as should the medical tools. Uh, so there are, there are good points and bad points. And if you ca carry something too far in any direction, you're probably not going to have great success. When surgery, uh, uh, when modern surgery was developed, which is probably uh, when you look at Johns Hopkins and uh, the famous surgeons from there, there was really an emphasis on speed. Speed was critical. And uh, number one, they didn't know how to treat shock. Uh, they didn't have modern blood transfusion. But there was also ether, and ether was a very dangerous anesthetic, and it was critical to operate as quickly as possible. And as anesthesia improved, uh, at least some of the pressure, it's still important to not be there longer than one needs to be, uh, but that was important. And Lillian Gilbreth uh, got her PhD, and it was very interesting. She uh, completed her PhD work in California and they refused to award her PhD. They said she wasn't on campus enough. So she moved to, I guess, New Jersey and completed her PhD irregardless and was the first woman to give a uh, commencement address at uh, a university in California. She had a very interesting life, a very outstanding person. Any other questions? Do you feel that some of Taylor's original ideas were lost in the like development of the current medical record system when trying to make it more cost effective? And what are some ways that electronic medical record system today can learn from scientific management? Uh, that's a, a, obviously I'm not an electronic engineer, but I have some uh, experiential strong ideas. I think what happened, and I have another slide, it's uh, it, it, it's really interesting in a lot of different historical venues when you're looking for cause and effect if you follow the money. And if you look at the where the money 
came into American medicine, uh, it's my belief that when, when medicine became 20% of gross national product or more, when Medicare and Medicaid became federally funded, when uh, Medicare pays for transplants, when Medicare pays for implantable defibrillators, there's a huge amount of money coming in. And this 20% of gross national product excites a lot of interest in how to maximize the money. So you have a huge structure of coders and billing people and courses. It, it's incentivized to emphasize billing and collection. And it is, it is much harder to tell a narrative. This perfect discharge sum, and I, I don't have it anymore, but it, it, it told the story. And it told the story so you knew what to do next. I worked at a private, the largest private hospital in the United States for several years. And one of the uh, senior cardiologists was a revered cardiologist. He'd been in World War II, he was really a nice guy. But he would uh, write his discharge summary in pen in one paragraph. You know, you'd have a patient there for two weeks and it'd be, four lines, and I thought that was, uh, my discharge summaries for four weeks were eight or 10 pages long. I thought I was right. But I think people got more from that. And I think that nowadays, there's a critical, you know, in military uh, operations, the most dangerous points are where two, two units overlap. You have a, division here and they're they're next to each other and thing bad things happen where they're side by side because you know that bridge doesn't get taken care of it's the other guy and today there is such an emphasis on limiting inpatient reducing the cost and then going to outpatient that the transition from inpatient to outpatient could be better addressed in the medical record. For one thing, your medical record shouldn't, is really a living, continuing document. It was at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, your medical record should flow from inpatient to outpatient to inpatient to ER. And I think that additions could be made. There's no sense taking the family history 10 different times. Those are efficiencies that haven't been looked at. And the other thing is you can't cut and paste a narrative. You know, if you take uh, some of the medical records where you, where you cut and paste and you just cut, and, and I'm the world's worst cut and paster, but if, if you cut and paste all the x-ray reports, you have 10 pages of x-ray reports. Well. What you'd really nice like is a synopsis of the key findings and what you did. And at the bottom of the medical record, what you need to do next. So I think that data people need to look at, there's nothing wrong with billing. That's how you pay for the medical record. But I don't think there's enough emphasis in creating a place in the medical record, even the ER visit, for a narrative that tells a story. Is that, did that answer your question? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I enjoyed doing this. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wood. And thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.